All right, go ahead and make your prediction now. Who would win in a fight? 200 Kung Fu practitioners with melee weapons or one Marine with a machine gun? <laughs> Today we're talking about the most gangster marine ever. A man so remarkable that General Lejeune himself would declare him to be the most outstanding marine of all time. A man that was so fierce on the battlefield that General Smedley D. Butler, one of only two marines to ever receive the Medal of Honor twice, would declare him to be the fightinest marine he ever knew. Ladies and gentlemen, the only other marine to receive the Medal of Honor twice Sergeant Major Dan Daly. Born in New York on November 11th, 1873, Dan Daly would grow up competing as an amateur boxer as well as working as a paperboy. And while working as a paperboy might seem like the useless details you throw in at the beginning to humanize the main character, in this case, it's anything but because him working as a paperboy would create a butterfly effect through time that would change the US military as a whole. You see, you gotta remember that this is the late 1800s and information and news didn't spread the same way it does today. So working as a paperboy back then meant that he always got the newspaper meaning that he had more information at his fingertips than 99% of the population. Because of this, he would be able to closely follow the exploits of future President Theodore Roosevelt and his famous Rough Riders all throughout the Spanish-American War. And this would go on to be his inspiration to join the U.S. Marine Corps, hoping that he too would be able to fight in the Spanish-American War. So that's exactly what he would do on January 10th, 1899, when Dan Daly would enlist in the United States Marine Corps at the age of 16 years old, coming in at only 5 foot 6 and 135 pounds. But hey, as the old adage goes, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, it's about the size of the fight in the dog. You see, the real problem here wasn't his stature, but the fact that he joined a fight in the Spanish-American War, and the Spanish-American War ended on December 10th, 1898, exactly one month prior to his enlistment date, but the news hadn't spread that far yet, so he ships off to training anyways. So fast forward, he finishes up training, realizing the Spanish-American War is over, he's kind of like, meh, I mean, the Spanish got off lucky, can't help it. I mean, let's face it, I'm gonna get the action I'm looking for at some point, right? This is America. We've been a country for like 124-ish years at this point. We've been not in armed conflict for all of like 45 seconds at this point. Surely something's gonna pop up soon. So he ends up getting put on ship duty over in the Asianic fleet on the USS Newark. And sure enough, like after a month of being there, the Boxer Rebellion breaks out and guess whose ship is the closest one to be able to respond? Dan Daly. All right, real quick, oversimplified explanation of what the Boxer Rebellion is in case you have absolutely no idea. At this point in time, China had really just been opened up to the rest of the world and foreign influence is just flooding in. You have Western businesses going in there trying to make money. You've got Western governments going in there being like, hey, you guys want some democracy? And then you had missionaries going in there also trying to spread Christianity. And all of this influence came so fast, so quick that a large portion of the Chinese population felt that it was too much, too soon, and they started to push back and started a nationalist movement. Part of this nationalist movement was a bunch of young men that practiced Kung Fu. Now, to somebody from the West, Kung Fu looks an awful lot like shadow boxing, so they just referred to these young men as boxers, hence the term Boxer Rebellion. These boxers got together, started their own little club called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist, and then proceeded to run around beating the shit out of and or killing every foreign diplomat, businessman, and missionary they could find. And it is at that point that the Marines get sent in. So Private Daly and the rest of the Marines show up to Peking, China, which would later go on to become known as Beijing, the capital of China, at which point they promptly and immediately take over a large legation center on the southern border wall of the city, known as the Tartar Wall. They then gather up all the refugees they can find, get them inside the legation center, and set up a defensive perimeter. Things are going well, now we're just waiting for reinforcements. Problem, hours and hours go by, the reinforcements don't show up, and it's about to be dark out. So at this point, the Marine leadership's thinking like, hey, the reinforcements are definitely on the way, they wouldn't just leave us here, which means the reinforcements have gotten lost, because I mean, let's face it, if there was ever a time or a place where the directions of go to the giant building on the big fucking wall wasn't specific enough, it would be in China, right? I mean, they're known for their big ass walls, it's kind of their thing. So they're lost out there, we need to go find them before nighttime, otherwise they're gonna get ambushed by like a thousand of these kung fu guys, and they're all gonna get killed. So, we're all gonna leave, go find the reinforcements, and come back, Private Daly, you're gonna stand guard here by yourself. Now, I don't know what the logic was behind this. I don't know if it was like, fuck Private Daly, he's the new guy, he can have the shitty job, or if it was like, hey, Private Daly's a new guy, this mission's really dangerous, let's leave him here where it's safe, or maybe they knew he was the main character and that he had plot armor, I have no idea. Either way, Private Daly is now effectively playing goalie for America for all of these refugees. So sure enough, like an hour after all the other Marines leave, hundreds of boxer rebels show up and they're looking for a fight. Now, a couple of them have guns like muskets 
helmets and stuff, really outdated weaponry. By and large, they're all carrying traditional Chinese martial arts weapons like swords, bow staffs, what have you. Some of them are even just rocking the old meat mittens, but they're looking for a fight either way. And this is shaping up to be one of the most ridiculous battles of all time. I mean, this is the type of stuff you get drunk at the bar and ask your buddy like, hey, you think you could take on all 300 Spartans if you had a machine gun? Like, that's exactly what's about to go on here. I mean, in one corner, you've got an 18-year-old Marine with a machine gun, and in the other corner, you have 200 martial artists with, like, bow staffs and shit. You literally have Gun Fu versus Kung Fu, okay? And here's the kicker with the entire thing. The Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist legitimately and wholeheartedly believes that their martial arts training has made them impervious to bullets. Yeah. So this entire horde of kung fu fighters just starts running at daily as fast as they can as he opens fire with his machine gun and they fight well into the night. The rest of the marines were a couple miles away, they found the reinforcements, but now it's too dark for them to travel in this rioting city at night safely, so they've adopted a little defensive position and they're just holding position until daylight. They're literally forced to just sit there and listen to the machine gun fire and the yelling and the screaming and machine gun fire, machine gun fire, and then suddenly the machine gun runs out of ammo and then there's bolt action rifle fire, bolt action rifle fire fire. He gets the machine gun reloaded. There's more machine gun fire. And this goes on for hours. And then it progressively just gets slower. And there's less machine gun fire and less screaming and less machine gun fire and less screaming. And then suddenly it just stops. At this point, the Marines have to accept the fact that their friend has just died courageously in battle, fighting an entire mob by himself because they left him alone. And all the civilians that they've been tasked with protecting are going to be slaughtered. And now all they can do is sit there and wait for the sun to come up. So the sun comes up and the Marines start making their way back to the legation center, but they're kind of dragging their feet because, well, they know what they're going to find. They're really just there to recover the remains of Private Daly and make sure that those are taken care of. And they start making their way there. And as they get closer, they're like, Man, D Private Daly really took out a lot of these guys. That's impressive. And they get closer and like, holy shit, he took out a ton of these guys. This is the most aerodynamic mass grave I've ever seen. And they get to the top of the wall and there's Private Daly smoking his pipe, leaning up against his machine gun. And they're like, holy shit, you made it. He's like, yeah, why wouldn't I? Well, we heard the machine gun stop firing and we just assumed that you'd been killed. He's like, no, 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 no. I only quit firing because they quit coming. Dan Daly has effectively pulled off the impossible. He has single-handedly defeated 200 rebels by himself, saving all of the civilians as well as saving the day. All the Marines are like, holy shit, we're gonna nominate this guy for the Medal of Honor because this is incredible. All the businessmen and the delegates are like, oh my God, we've seen what one Marine can do and now we've got 1,200 Marines. We're definitely gonna make it out of this alive. Hooray. And all the missionaries are like, oh, my God, this is not what we meant when we said we wanted to make these people more holy. Shortly after this, Dan Daly would be awarded his first Medal of Honor for the battle, and then he would go on to continue serving in the Marine Corps as if nothing had happened. Okay, fast forward 15 years, now Gunnery Sergeant Daly has been involved in every military conflict the U.S. has for the past two decades. He is one of the most experienced combat veterans in the entire U.S. military, and he is a living legend in the Marine Corps. And on October 24th of 1915, Gunnery Sergeant Daly would find himself leading a platoon of men through Haiti during during the Cacos Rebellion. Just after his entire company would cross a river, his entire company would be attacked on all three sides by over 400 Cacos rebels, forcing them to retreat back into the river. And while doing so, the horse carrying the crew served machine gun would be shot and sink to the bottom of the river, as the remaining Marines continued to cross the river before adopting a defensive position to repel the attack until nightfall. It is now pitch black outside, and Gunnery Sergeant Daly knows as soon as the sun comes up, they are going to get attacked again, and the only chance they have is to get that machine gun back from the bottom of the river. So he takes off by himself in the dark of night, goes all the way back to the river, and just begins diving to the bottom of the river, trying to find this dead horse with the machine gun strapped to it. And after hours of trying, he finally finds this horse, manages to go down, untie the machine gun, come back up for air, go back down again, getting pieces, ammunition, the gun itself, the tripod. He gathers up all of this stuff, gets it out of the river, and then straps it to his back and carries it back to his men. Bear in mind, that is over 200 pounds of equipment, and this guy is 5'6", 135 pounds, but he gets it done anyways. Now, 
Marines believe in a couple things when it comes to a gunfight. Number one, bring a gun. Number two, bring friends with guns. Number three, decide to be aggressive enough quickly enough. If you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that he is not about to use this machine gun for self-defense. He's about to use this machine gun for self-offense. First thing in the morning, he gets his men together. They launch an attack first, scattering the enemy into the jungle, retreating, and Daly has effectively saved himself and all of his men, earning himself his second Medal of Honor. Fast forward two years, June 1st, 1917. It's World War I, and Daly is now a first sergeant, leading an entire platoon of young, inexperienced Marines into the Battle of Bella Wood. If you don't know the Battle of Bella Wood, the Germans are just rampaging through France, making a beeline right towards Paris. And at Bella Wood, the US Army, the Marine Corps, the French Army, and the British Army all get together to stop the German military in their tracks. Now, this made it not only a strategic battlefield, but a symbolic battlefield, because how dare you stop the mighty German military. Now they're going to hit back twice as hard just to prove that it was a fluke. Because of this, right after they stopped the German military on June 1st, the French military is like, okay, we stopped them. Let's take the W and head back to Paris and we'll fight from there. We don't want to get slaughtered in this wood line by the Germans because they're pissed. And it is at this point that the Marine leadership famously responded by saying, and I quote, retreat, hell, we just got here. And then the Marine Corps pretty much dons their gas masks fixes bayonets, and proceeds to fight their ass off for the next 26 days straight. Okay, here's what I need you to understand. On paper, the Marine Corps should absolutely not win this fight. They are both outnumbered and outclassed. The German military is one of the most veteran fighting militaries on the planet at this point in time, and the Marine Corps is primarily comprised of a bunch of 18-year-old kids that have never seen combat. However, leading those 18-year-old kids is a bunch of fucking badasses like Dan Daly. Okay, this video started with him being a paperboy from New York. He is now a 45 year old man with two medals of honor that has been in the marine corps since he was 16 years old this man is a grizzled veteran that has been there done that and has a t-shirt and he is about to don his plot armor and fuck shit up so the battle of bellawood kicks off on june 1st pretty much immediately first sergeant daly's lieutenant gets shot and he is now out of the fight okay okay if you don't know what that means the officer is the one guy on the battlefield that sort of kind of pretends like he gives a fuck and he is now gone the regulator is off the war machine and first sergeant dan daly is now in charge of his entire company unopposed. Fast forward June 5th, German artillery strikes the ammunition depot, lighting everything on fire. Dan Daly leads his entire platoon in, sets the fire out, prevents all the ammunition from exploding, saves the entire battle. Fast forward five days, June 10th, the German machine gun squad would try to advance on Daly's company. Daly would get up by himself with nothing but three frag grenades and his Colt 1911, using the three grenades to disable the machine gun before approaching, shooting their commanding officer, killing him, and taking the other 14 Germans as prisoners of war. Fast forward a couple of hours, still June 10th, Dan Daly looks around at the faces of the young men that he's leading through this battle, and they're looking tired. They're looking like this is the worst time of their life, and it is at this point that Dan Daly decides that he needs to get aggressive enough quickly enough. This battle's effectively been a stalemate for the last 10 days, and he's had enough of this bullshit, so he gets up, walks right out into the open in this wheat field that's functioning as no man's land between the Marines and the Germans. He looks at the Germans line, turns around, looks at his Marines and yells, come on you sons of bitches, do you want to live forever before charging at the German line? All of his Marines, that's Dan fucking Daly, we're gonna follow him, so they charge too. In an act of pure hyper-aggression, Dan Daly's company would catch the Germans off guard and would actually manage to punch through their line, causing all the other Marines to become hyper-aggressive and attack as well. Effectively setting off a chain reaction that would lead to the Marine Corps pushing the Germans all the way out of Bella Wood over the course of the next 16 days, where on June 26, American High Command would receive a single telegram, and I quote, Woods now Marine Corps entirely, giving America its first win in World War I and the Marine Corps its new moniker. Due to the blatant hyper-aggression of the Marines, the Germans began calling them the Teufelhunden, or the Devil Dogs. And it's all because of the actions of First Sergeant Dan Daly. After the Battle of Bella Wood, Daly would continue to serve throughout World War I until on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the Germans would surrender, effectively ending World War I, which is why in America we celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th, which is also, by sheer coincidence, I'm sure, 
Dan Daly's birthday. The guy's the main character. I don't know what to tell you. So then, because Dan Daly was like the badass at the Battle of Bellawood, he gets put up for yet another Medal of Honor, potentially becoming the first man in American history to pull off the Medal of Honor hat trick, getting the three-peat. Absolutely everybody that was there that day all signs off on it. His men, his chain of command, they do the paperwork, they send it off to DC to get this man his medal. Then the political side is like, no, absolutely not. We don't care if he earned it or not. It's not about getting what you deserve. It's about doing what we think is fair and we don't think it's fair that he should get three medals of honor. So we're just not going to give it to him because we said so. Go fuck yourself. So instead, they go ahead and they give him the Distinguished Service Cross and the Navy Cross, which if you don't know, both of those are like tied for the second highest military honor because apparently second plus second equals first. I guess. Anyways, so he gets those instead. And then bear in mind, this is 1919, right after World War I. Like a month later in 1919, the military creates a new law that you're only allowed to earn one Medal of Honor. Okay, Dan Daly is so fucking gangster. They literally had to change the rules on how many times you're allowed to achieve the highest honor in the military. After World War I, he would retire as a sergeant major, having turned down becoming a commissioned officer on multiple occasions, citing that he would rather be an outstanding sergeant than just another officer. He would then go on to work as a bank security guard where for 17 years he would be the living embodiment of the world's shittiest lottery ticket for anybody dumb enough to try to rob that bank. Could you imagine just being some bank robber trying to get some quick cash and you run into the most gangster Marine of all time? Okay, I'm just gonna throw it out there. He didn't retire from being a bank security guard until 1936 and John Dillinger's bank robbing spree was from 1933 to 1934. So for a couple of years there, there was a significantly greater than 0% chance that the world almost got the ultimate clash of the bank robbing gangster and the most gangster Marine to ever live. And I'm gonna go ahead and write that down in my book as the coolest thing to never actually happen. In conclusion, Mark Twain is frequently accredited with the famous quote, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. When in reality, it wasn't Mark Twain that said that first. It was actually Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star army general and the 34th president of the United States. Somebody that would have known good and well who Sergeant Major Dan Daly was. And I think that maybe, just maybe, he had that five foot six, 135 pound devil dog on his mind when he came up with that quote. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. I cannot believe that my favorite character from Starship Troopers is actually based off Dan Daly, and I had no idea. Come on, you hey, You want to live forever? I expect the best, and I give the best. Here's the bear. Yeah!